Uh, hello, one and all. Thank you for coming to our first event of the 2019-2020 uh, academic year. Um, we plan to have about four to six events this year. Um, ranging topics, all on neurology. Um, we, we've had, this is about our 12th or 13th event in three years. We've had some great events in the past. Um, we've had everywhere from over 100 people to as well as 20 people. And we're looking forward to having more events, and we encourage everybody and anybody to come to our events if they interest you, sign up for our mailing list. Um, this is all being recorded for posterity, for our, our speaker here, Ron Shore, um, who's going to be basically there to share his knowledge to the universe from now on through the York University Neurology Research Association of York University and us. Um, I want to thank our video blogger here. Say, why don't you give a big hello? Hi. Hi. Um, he actually has a... Um, podcast. Yeah, he has, he has a podcast. So actually it has a podcast, it's called The Missing Pages, and it's psychedelic based, you could say. Yeah. Um, his next, it's gonna be next Sunday, he's gonna have Dan Gregg from U of T, who organizes Mapping the Minds, who some of you have been to in here, um, and we look forward to that. Uh, this is our president, Danny Dwyer. Hey everybody, thanks for coming, and uh, thanks Ron for coming, and uh, we're looking forward to a fantastic talk. It's going to be really amazing. And I'm sure you're, I'm going to leave with a lot of great ideas to yeah. think about. Yeah. Um, Ali Messia. Hi, everyone. I am the Vice President of the Neurology Research Association. I am very excited to be here and excited to learn from you tonight. So thank yeah. you. And our long-term executive, Harley Glassman, who's been here since the beginning with me. Through many struggles. I gotta say, Harley and I have been through many struggles. We worked together through a lot and we got through a lot and we're glad to have continued it. Um, I'm thankful for Ron coming out here tonight and spreading some pretty groundbreaking work. So, and we hope you all enjoy the talk. Yeah. And my name is Ivan Rusik, I'm Vice President of Finance. Um, I don't have I'm not in this field per se, I'm interested. This is something I'm very much interested in due to my father having a traumatic brain injury many years ago through my, through my own struggles with um, depression, and anxiety, certain other things, and certain other things I went through in my life. I think we all should have at least a basic understanding of neurology. Um, we came to Ron Shore through <coughs> Danny Dwyer and his last talk at Mapping the Mind. Uh, Ron has had a pretty long career. Um, he actually set up the first needle exchange. I, I didn't know this till tonight. He set up the first needle exchange as harm reduction in Kingston, Ontario. Great work there. I think, what were you, sixth or seventh in, in Canada? Probably. Yeah, sixth or seventh in all of Canada. Uh, in the last 14 years, he's been lecturing at, at uh, Queen's University. And I was about to say he's a PhD candidate, but he's going to be a PhD candidate in like two or three months. For now, he's just a PhD student, but I'm not going to say just. He's a PhD student with a lot of knowledge, and he's going to ingratiate us, ingratiate us with all his wisdom this evening. Everybody, please welcome Rod Shore. Perspective on things. 
uh, which seems to be typical of my life. I'm always kind of a bit of an outsider. Uh, and even now, the discipline that I'm getting a PhD in is actually health promotion. So I've taught a, pro uh, a course called Introduction to the Study of Drug and Alcohol Problems at Queen's now for 14 years. I teach 350 students a year. It's a second year course. Uh, and my background, really, I came out of the community health sector. I started some harm reduction programming in Kingston, including the Street Health Center. Uh, I worked in the early days with prisoners who had HIV AIDS. Um, we started a methadone clinic, and this was all kind of pre-opioid overdose epidemic. So I left kind of community health management about six years ago, uh, started a business, and, and then decided that I really wanted to return to school, largely as a passion for better, improved, and novel treatments for self-regulatory and mood disorders. Because if I looked at the entire span of my career, which was you know, 25 years working with um, comorbid concurrent disorder, kind of people with severe addiction, also PTSD, anxiety, and depression. We were able to keep people alive, and I've had amazing relationships now with people in our community for going on 30 years, uh, which has been awesome, and no doubt we're able to keep people alive. But I always felt like we didn't quite do the notion of, of um, health justice. I thought the notion of returning to the whole, people really living full, flourishing lives, um, we never really got to when we're looking at people with active addiction, largely because our treatments are pretty ineffectual. Generally, when we're looking at rates of success in addiction, uh, you know, we're looking at maybe 8 to 14 percent for most treatment centers. Methadone would have a higher treatment success rate. And then if you look at anxiety and depression, uh, PTSD, um, ADHD, OCD, I think it's fair to acknowledge we're in a bit of a crisis state in terms of our approach to psychiatry. So I don't know if you're familiar with the notion of a triple crisis in psychiatry, where we have a failure of diagnostics, treatment, and ability to kind of prevent. So we're seeing increases in uh, incidence of, of these very um, difficult disorders. Our treatments are largely ineffectual for at least half of the population, if not more. And the very notion of the diagnostics are coming into question. What really is the difference between anxiety and PTSD? Where is the dividing line or the boundary? So we're emerging different ways of thinking, new paradigms of thought. Uh, you may be familiar with Robin Carter Harris, this popularized notion of the unified theory of mental health, that they're all at their root, what they have in common is excessive rumination. So for me, my interest in the psychedelics was spurred by a desire for new and more effective treatment. But I think that in general, I've always had a fascination with drugs, and I've always had a fascination with consciousness, and I've kind of been involved in the drug sector since I was quite young. Um, did psychedelics as a young teenager, it was a very positive experience for me. Uh, and then in my late teens, my mother was quite sick and passed away when I was 20 years old. So I spent a, a lot of time around death and dying. And she gave us the gift of a beautiful death. So I learned a lot from that. And I continue to this day to work with people who are kind of palliative or dying. So I think there's a calling for the medicine in that field as well. So my research is looking at psilocybin and its emerging clinical, therapeutic, uh, potential application in the treatment of self-regulatory disorders such as addiction and affective or mood disorders like depression and anxiety. I think what you're going to see is the, the vanguard of this movement really will be the palliative care, the terminal uh, care, uh, physicians and movement. And people familiar with a group called Theracil, which is coming out of Vancouver. Uh, our good friend of ours named Bruce Tobin is a long time psychotherapist who's been petitioning Health Canada for two, two and a half years now to get special access to psil for psilocybin to use with people who are dying. And I think he'll be successful soon. Um, so I think 2020 will be the year that you see the first clinical trials with psilocybin in Canada. <coughs> we're going to hopefully have some preclinical trials and animal models that we're doing in Queens as well. Uh, and then I think you'll see Bruce get special access for that group as well. So I think you're going to see a lot change. Uh, can folks name an American municipality that has decriminalized psilocybin and other plant medicines? Denver, Denver Oakland. Colorado. Colorado, Denver, Colorado. Yeah, there's One more. Some, there's a few more. That Chicago, are, Illinois. There's a few more that are actually uh, yeah. applied for. Yeah, and I think the whole state of Oregon is looking at decriminalizing. So you're seeing a movement. Um, people from a company called Field Trip Ventures, which is based out of Toronto, you heard of Field Trip. So they are folks from the cannabis sector who are now starting uh, a different company, looking at expanding uh, both the growth and the distribution of the biomass of psilocybe mushrooms, they're convinced that there are alkaloids and compounds beyond psilocybin or psilocin in the mushrooms that will have medicinal value, much like with cannabis with the entourage effect. So the cannabis folks are now getting involved in mushrooms. 
getting involved in the expansion of psychotherapy clinics, uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy clinics are only a matter of time. As you may know, there are ketamine clinics in Ontario right now, including Etobicoke. Ketamine can be used psychedelically, um, and you have ketamine assisted therapies are in place. So really, this is an emerging, I think it's, it's fair to say it's not just emerging anymore. I think you're seeing a tide, you're seeing a movement. Uh, and the level of interest um, is pretty significant. So what, part of what we're trying to do is our research program at Queen's has a couple different elements, and one is uh, what we would call knowledge synthesis. So we spent a lot of time over the last year and a half synthesizing the information that we can around what we know about psilocybin and its application in clinical trials. So we just finished a manuscript looking at the nine clinical trials that have used psilocybin for a range of disorders, including obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, substance use uh, disorder, including tobacco and alcohol, end of life anxiety and distress, demoralization among long-term AIDS survivors, and unipolar depression, and I think I said OCD. So those are the, 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 the major clinical indications that have been studied. And in every case, the, method, the psilocybin clinical trials have found been found to be safe, tolerable, and show preliminary evidence of, of efficacy. So we're seeing kind of rates of um, diminishment of problematic symptomology that exceeds traditional or existing treatments. So there is promise. However, the science is still new. And in terms of clinical trials, less than half of the nine trials were randomized or controlled. Uh, and more than half were in application of people who had advanced cancer diagnoses. The demographics tend to be quite well functioning. Uh, there were exclusion criteria that kind of minimized risks in the trials. But the trials are showing very promising information. But it's still early. So we're trying to synthesize the knowledge. So we did the summary of the clinical trials. We're now doing the summary of the animal models on psilocybin to know what we can learn from all the animal clinical studies or preclinical studies that have been done using psilocybin. And then we're doing our own preclinical trials using, um, uh, using uh, rodents who, within a 21-day period, can be um, scheduled to develop OCD-type symptoms. The whole issue of animal studies is new to me, and I've had some ethical issues trying to overcome. But I think it's part of advancing the science and the knowledge. Ultimately, we want to decriminalize, and we want to legalize access to these therapeutic medicines. And I think you need to build the science, so that's how I make sense of this. Uh, plus, we're going to give them psilocybin. Uh, and so hopefully that will, our hope is, our, our hypothesis is the OCD-type symptoms that we can develop by scheduling the feeding, we can diminish or, or cause to uh, at least end with the application of one to two doses of psilocybin. So that's part of what we're doing. And then we're involved in a clinical trial, uh, which is yet to be approved, hopefully will be approved this coming year, working with people with end-of-life uh, disorders. And then uh, a fourth part of our research program is knowledge translation. So things like this. So I do a lot of public speaking around psilocybin, because I think it's important <coughs> that we not only build awareness, but we build the infrastructure of a movement. And I don't mean necessarily a political movement, but if we're going to advance the practices around plant-based medicines or psilocybin, uh, not only do we need to understand the brain science and the neuroscience and the physiology, but we also need to develop the capacity that we have as individuals <laughs> and as universities and as organizations to do this. So part of what we've done, and I'm just, I'll skip ahead here to my first slide, is, and before I move on, I just have to say, one of the great things about lecturing about psychedelics is I get but they both take you to the same place, and the field becomes very comfortable, very familiar, but they're full, both uh, serotonin, 5-HT2A, R agonists, so psilocybin, and ayahuasca, and many of you have probably experienced the vine or the mother. Um, very similar states they can bring you to. They're considered classic psychedelics that are similar. Peyote or mescaline would also be a classic psychedelic, although it has an amphetamine type experience. And if you listen to a lot of ceremonial music, you'll notice ayahuasca music is very lilting and calm and kind of sweet because you're hypersensitive, right? You're hypersensitive to sound, often synesthesia. And psilocybin, you have the psilocybin ceremonial tradition I'm going to talk about. If you are familiar with Maria Sabina, if you haven't listened to Maria Sabina's chance, you can actually listen to it on Spotify. You can find the recording of Mushroom Ceremony of the Mazatec Indians. Still, you can get that and listen to it. It was recorded by Gordon Wasson when he originally met Maria Sabina. I'll talk about that. So you'll notice the difference in the music, but uh, they're both similar, and I, and I love this. To me, this is about, we talk a lot about mysticism when it comes to psychedelics. It's the mechanism of change, of mystical experiences, of unity, of transcendence, overcoming fear, taking new perspectives. But often what happens, and Terrence McKenna is really clear on this. I remember Terrence McKenna? It's about time we had a Terrence McKenna revival. If you read Terrence's stuff, he was so much ahead of his time. I was the same with Ernie Norris, reading one of his books again. I can't believe that. Just, I realized so much of my thought has been influenced him by him. I didn't even realize I was feeling the of his ideas. So he's that formative. So, uh, But Terrence is really clear that part of what you encounter in the psilocybin experience is the presence of an entity, the presence of a spirit. 
And this is where in Western culture we all begin to be a little bit uncomfortable. And the whole thing about psychosis and psychedelics starts to rise. What do you mean you're talking to spirits? But I've come to, to kind of begin to address this by talking about plant communication. And I think if you look at the, the science of botany, of biology, um, if you look at mycology, if you study trees at all, super familiar with the notion of mycorrhizomial networks. So not only do you have the mycelia from the mushrooms spreading those thin white fibers underground and all that interconnected things. Really, mushrooms are just the fruiting body that come up from these massive networks of mycelia. But mycelia interacts with tree roots, and we know for a fact they share not only information, but they communicate. They share resources and they share information and knowledge. Um, and plants have been shown to learn in terms of associative learning. Uh, as humans, we always thought consciousness was the, the sole purview of this elevated human species, and we alone have intelligence. But we're beginning to finally realize that the climate change crisis is, if we don't respond to this, then there's some, obviously something really wrong with us. But the climate change crisis is, is, is asking us to return to the whole, to a reconnection with nature. And what we do when we do that is we realize nature has spirit, nature has presence. There are many cultures that recognize the personhood of rivers or of mountains or of trees. And in Western cultures, we've come up with this rational, sovereign, separate, intellectual sense of self, where we're somehow separate from the world. And we know that's not true. You know, we, we realize that there's energetic connections between us, empathy, mirror neurons in a class of examples. So we have our own invisible mycelia that join us. But when we start to think about spirits, and the spirit of the plant, the spirit of the mushroom, um, it's taking us to a new place, but it's also taking us to a very old place. So this is what Terence McKenna called the archaic revival. Uh, I call the age of remembering. So I think the unfortunate thing is we're in an age of dying. Uh, mass species extinction, cultural linguistic loss, uh, the loss of flora, fauna, the destruction of the Amazon as we know, melting of the icebergs, rising of water levels. So as we have this mass extinction, we're also remembering things from the past because literally the past is being released into our presence. The ice and the molecules have been stored for really billions of years in the north and are being released into our water system. You have the Siberian permafrost is, is thawing, and you have the bones and the archaeology and the relics of our past rising. And we're finding more and more evidence of our past relationship with psychoactive plants, which we have used for 60,000 years. Neanderthal times. Our conscious use of psychoactive plants goes back to the very evolution of our species. And you're probably familiar with Terence's conjecture or theory of the stone date, which is that really the theory is that our experience of, of when we move from kind of tree living into bipedal binocular vision, we started to follow um, herds of ungulates or cattle. Psilocybe mushroom, as you know, grows in dung. And so the theory is at some point in human history, there's a massive evolution of our brain, our ability, language, culture, and Terence's theory, which I think may have some credit. And if you look at the mycology, and you know, who knows of Gaston Guzman, probably the most famous mycologist that said Terence McKenna. Really, he's the one who identified Tiona de Cattle as the sacred mushroom of Mexico. And he looked at the worldwide distribution of psilocybe. And, and McKenna may have had a really good point. It, it, it may very well have indeed our early exposure to some psychoactive plants that was the birth of religion, that was the birth of spirituality, uh, the birth of shamanism, and probably really led to an expansion of language. And I'm going to talk a little bit of language up later on. So lots of reasons to be discouraged in our world, but also lots of reasons to take hope because I think we're rediscovering and remembering part of ourselves and who we are in our connection with nature. And I think if mushrooms teach us anything, it's exactly that because and we'll, we'll talk about a lot. So anyways, get to show great art. Uh, we're going to talk about consciousness. Delos is the name of our lab, much like you have an association here and you do these kind of public events. We meet every two weeks, and we have public lectures. I have of students. I have 42 students in our lab. I have four graduate students who help me co-facilitate. We take turns researching area, presenting it. Students presenting papers or workshopping papers. They get guest lecturers in. As fortunate, I had Dennis McKenna last year, Mark Hayden, um, and a number of other kind of notable people in terms of Canadian psychedelic research. So we're called Delos. Delos is part of one of the root words of, of psychedelic. It means to bring into the light to reveal, which really is, this is about bringing into the light our knowledge of ourselves, of consciousness, and of our relationship to the natural world. And a local artist did that. I just love the eye in the middle of the hummingbird, so that's, uh, I like to show that off. So you're probably familiar, we're going to start this with a couple familiar quotes. You probably know William James, who's really from a Western perspective, the first person to really start tackle issues of spirituality and expansion of consciousness, which we now know as kind of peak experiences, to use kind of uh, Maslow's term. But you can see here, his point here is that our, our sense of consciousness and of reality 
in our culture, we're really taught that there's only one consciousness, which traditionally and in indigenous cultures has never really been the truth. We recognize there's different states of consciousness. Most societies consciously cultivate alternate or alternative or altered states of consciousness for the purpose of bonding, for the purpose of elevating life, for the purpose of spirituality. Uh, in the far north, where they don't have the botany of the plants and the medicines that we have available to us here, or that are really rich in the Amazon, they would use fasting, vision quests, throat singing. So you really can't find a culture that has an altered consciousness for the purpose of elevation of spirit. So we're in good company. Uh, James really, again, points out just this notion that our, our normal sense of waking consciousness is, is just but one form of consciousness. You know, what he calls a filmy or a flimsy screen that separates us from other dimensions of consciousness, which the psychedelics are a lightning vehicle, if you're familiar with the history of Buddhism. Um, it's a Vajrayana type vehicle where you have a kind of sudden crystalline or lightning bolt experience which brings you to a state of insight. And that's what psychedelics can do. There are issues obviously around spiritual bypass where people have a download of information or see or experience things that they're not really ready to fully make sense of, so that's where integration is very important and that's where preparation is important. Um, I have students every, all the time now who come up to me and say, I want to become a psychedelic assistant, psychotherapist, what do I need to do to get there? And I can literally look them in the face now and say, I think that they would do that in a couple of years, and this is what you should do to get training. So it's an exciting time. Uh, Stan Groff, uh, the famous quote that the importance of, psych of um, psychedelics to psychiatry is equivalent to that of a telescope or of a microscope for their disciplines, because it, it shows us some insight into the mind. And you know the root of, of psychedelic is mind manifesting. So something about these brings the inside out and the outside in, and it changes our perception of separation from the world. It changes our sense of separate ego, of a static, separate self from the evolution of other phenomena. So there's something about psychedelics that teaches us something, not just uh, about consciousness, but about our place in the world. And last but not least, this is about cleaning these doors of perception, opening this restrictive valve, which is the brain, I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, Carl Friston's theory of free energy principle. You guys are probably more knowledgeable in neuroscience than I am. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Robin Carhart Harris. Have people read Carhart Harris? Put up your hand if you've read any Carhart Harris. I know what you're doing up there. Okay, awesome. So you can help me kind of understand some of that. Um, so about psilocybin, um, the, the traditional application um, within um, the Oaxaca region of Mexico was to use these sacred mushrooms. And as far as we can figure out, there are three or four genus of the psilocybe mushroom that were identified as the sacred mushroom of Mexico, known as Tionanacatl, which is a like flesh of the gods. Although Guzman has a theory, it's also there, there's an, another word that should have been in there, another, um, uh, not word, but part of that word, which is more like one who paints the image of the god. So there's something about the visuals of, of psilocybin which are really important not to be dismissed. I've, I've read a lot where people think that the visuals are kind of just um, a frivolous kind of playful activity of the mind, but there's something about what we see under these states that I think is sacred and important. But you can see now we're, we're studying this fungus and, and the psilocybe genus for a variety of clinical applications. We know it's a 5-HT2AR receptor, which means your, your serotonin receptors, which are really, really rich in certain parts of your brain, is exactly what it's a full agonist to, so it bonds to that. And that is true of DMT, we found in ayahuasca, as well as uh, psilocybin, which gets um, metabolized as psilocin. So the psilocybe mushroom contains both psilocin and psilocybin. Your body metabolizes psilocybin as psilocin. And again, the mushroom companies, and I think they're onto something, are interested in the full biomass. It's not just psilocin, but there's biostasin and other kind of compounds which may have some uh, psychoactive components may have medicinal value as well. So there's many compounds in the mushroom, and we know there's about 200 species of mushrooms that are psychoactive. And as we know, mushrooms are just the fruiting body. They're like the sexual expression of these underground networks of mycelia. And really, they just pop up for the sole purpose of sporification. They're there to spread spores, or maybe to feed us, or maybe to teach us, right? And this is where this whole issue of, of an intelligence that can come through when we, uh, when we consume these things. So. Anyone tell me what this is? Psychedelic. This is psychedelic. Yeah, this is the classic picture from Johns Hopkins. Uh, you probably saw recently a massive amount of money is going through the research center now. I had the good fortune of hearing Bill Richards speak here in Toronto a couple years ago. Maybe Bill Richards at the Institute of Traditional Medicine two years ago. He was awesome. So Bill Richards was the leading therapist. Has written a book called Sacred Knowledge. Beautiful man. Um, and this is two therapists sitting with someone who's undergoing. 
um, psilocybin-assisted therapy in one of the Johns Hopkins studies. You can see the whole model is the eye shades and the headphones laying back, supplying. You can see the emphasis on passivity. It's what they call the inward journey. Um, personally, I would find it very difficult to lay still on the couch for four hours <laughs> under a high dose of psilocybin. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to move, yeah. right? Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to talk a little bit of the silence and inward journey. So what, the, what we've done is taken what's called the peak experience or the peak psychedelic model, which was born out of the 60s, really came out of Tim Leary and Richard Alpert, who became Ram Dass. And if you were curious about the music I was playing earlier, uh, that's East Forest. East Forest is an Oregon-based musician who just made an album with Ram Dass. So if you like Ram Dass, Richard Alpert from the Harvard Psilocybin Project and Tim Leary, Richard Albert went on to become Ram Dass, leading spiritual leader, read his stuff or listen to him, a beautiful man. Um, so they have an album that's together, and East Force has a, uh, an album of ceremonial music for mushrooms as well. So if you know people who take mushrooms and want to do it ceremonially, we don't necessarily have live traditions of mushroom shamanism yet. You can listen to East Force, it's a nice soundtrack, although I'm a big believer in, in live music when it comes to these kind of anthogenic states. If people sat through ayahuasca ceremonies, like you know the importance of of the role of the shaman, the role of singing, the role of voice, the role of music. Um, so here, they're taking it and kind of canning that experience into a template that's replicable. Um, the same soundtrack for everybody, same experience for everybody. So, and when you talk to the Johns Hopkins researchers, I don't know how many of you have the opportunity to talk to like Matthew Johnson uh, or, or Roland Griffiths, but they're really clear their main intention is to get this drug FDA approval so that it can get to help people. So the trials are built for drug approval. And as you probably know, psilocybin is stage three clinical trials right now. It's going to give a breakthrough therapy recognition. And MDMA is also stage three clinical trials, including sites in Canada, uh, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, I believe. So we're getting close to legalizing therapeutic access. And the models like this from a scientific perspective, because they're replicable, you've eliminated a lot of compounding variables. So that's kind of why they've gone this way. But there's also uh, a bit of a stuckness that we're using the same 60s model. And that's our critique in our manuscript on these trials. We have a number of critiques that obviously they're positive. But um, they only use a, a kind of high dose model. Um, and I think the reason that you haven't seen a clinical trial for a PTSD in psilocybin is that would definitely be a low dose application of psilocybin, in my opinion, to treat PTSD. We know low doses of psilocybin in animal studies will extinguish uh, fear conditioning. Um, so I think that these are all high dose. They're primarily looking at giving someone a transcendent or a mystical experience as a mechanism of change so that people can come out of these experiences with not just neuroplasticity, but new cognitive structures to make sense of their dying, of their death, of their place in the universe, and help overcome habitual thinking, rumination, habits of addiction, and we're going to talk about the mechanism of why we can do it. But this is kind of the scientific model that we've chosen to get drug approval for these. And, and and, and just one thing I will say is probably about 40% of the people in all these trials have mystical experiences. So I get stuck on one of the things, my, when we talk about mystical experiences, I, we haven't right, quite got the language on how to kind of suss all this out yet. Because for the people who don't have, quote, a classic mystical experience, they're still obviously having something that is elevated and important that I think to see it is not a mystical and we're missing out on something. But that's kind of the model. You can see the, 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 the mushroom stone in the back. Um, and the playlists are available on Spotify if you're interested in psychedelics and music, which I'm interested in psychedelics and sound. I think sound is very healing to begin with. All of them is obviously the sacred sound that is the basis of vibration of the universe. But music itself, the arc and the journey of music. Um, people are familiar with um, music as the hidden, uh, Mendel Kalin, who talked in Mapping the Minds. Yeah. Brilliant uh, piece called uh, Music as the Hidden Therapist. It's that arc to take us through these journeys. Because psychedelics create a state of entropy of uncertainty, of confusion, of newness, that without some movement, which is traditionally an application of music and shamanism and the energy work of a shaman, whether rattle or feather work, was meant to move things along. That's what the music and the headset is doing. And the eye shades are meant for an inward journey. So we're reducing external sensory input, trying to concentrate on the inward journey. The playlists are available on Spotify, um, both the Johns Hopkins one and Mendel Kalins used by Carter Hair Studies. So you can find those if you're interested in music. People know who this is? Who is this? Marie Sabina? Correct. Very, very important woman. Um, and the other person in the picture? Ready Eric Gordon Watson. Eric Gordon Watson, who is an interesting man. Uh, he and his wife, Valentina, were amateur mycologists, but they were probably some of the leading authorities in terms of mycology 
wrote a really lengthy uh, examination of Russia, Russian culture, and mushrooms. And he eventually gets introduced to Maria Sabine after years of trying. And this is the moment in which north meets south, east meets west, everything changes. We must acknowledge this is the moment that, which then leads to a lot of difficulty for Maria Sabina and the community as it gets inundated with Westerners come to discover this new psychedelic wonder. She eventually gets demonized by her community, driven out, and eventually a reconciliation and she's elevated to the state she should be, which is that of some sainthood in this area. She's a traditional shamaness, curandera, generational curandera. Her, her purpose is to work with people, to use the mu wondrous mushroom to show the footprints of the spirit so that she could see the source of illness, and she could see people's prognosis, see into the future, travel into the place where everything is already known, and bring that information back. She would consume the mushrooms, give the mushrooms to uh, her patients as well, in what was known as an all-night belata. A belata is a curing ceremony that generally would start quite late at night and go till dawn, and that sacred time of between 3 and 5 in the morning, when things were at their darkest, was really considered the peak, pinnacle of the, of the mushroom belata. She would sing and rattle the entire time. People would sit and be quiet, um, generally consume fresh mushrooms in pairs, and always in pairs, male and female, and there's a whole cosmology behind that. But this is just from one of her songs. Language is very important. Uh, if you're interested in psilocybin, one of the best articles to read, I think, is Henry Munn's article called The Mushrooms of Language. Henry Munn is an American poet who ends up in Mexico during some, I think, ethnopharmacology research, ends up marrying Maria Sabina's daughter, I believe. Uh, and then it gets it kind of inculcated into this culture of, of the curandera shamanism in Mexico. And he's a poet, and then he sits in all these ceremonies, and he puts language to what they say and describes the experience. It's a beautiful article, if you can find it. It's in Michael Harner's uh, Hallucinogens and Shamanism. Um, and very much, it took a very similar structure, often ending with MI. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the effect of psilocybin on language and connectivity. And, and how it suppresses latent inhibitions, so we have a more florid approach to language. Um, and I think obviously in, in a ceremony context, you don't want everybody talking, but in her case, really what she was digging into was the source of all creation, the source of all language, and her words and what came together were very important. Because you can kind of see the sense of kind of the, um, the ontology that she's getting here in terms of how she sees her place in the world. Um, just so you know, again, we're talking about classic serotonin, uh, serotonin psychedelics, converted to silas in, uh, in the body, and naturally occurring, found in hundred species of mushrooms. Um, you can see there's the chemical name, it's naturally occurring, it's a tryptamine, and it says a classification of chemicals, as, as phosphorylated prodrug to silicin, which is how your body gets that central active compound. So similar to LSD and DMT in that way. First isolated, identified in 1958 by Albert Hoffman, people know who Hoffman is, and synthesized and discovered the, the magic qualities of LSD, uh, one of the most influential scientists of our, of our times. So essentially, Hoffman got uh, various strains of, I think it was probably Mexicana. I think he got Psilocybe or Mexicana. Most of us who have had mushrooms have probably had Psilocybe cubensis, but the origin, which is worldwide in its distribution. But the Mexican Psilocybe is by Mexicana or has urines. Not sure which it was that he, that he ended up uh, synthesizing, but he found this the psychoactive molecule uh, within this. He was able to create a synthetic version of psilocybin. The, as the folklore goes, they returned this capsule Maria Sabina tried it and indeed vetted it as the real deal. She had experience with the spirit of the mushroom on the synthetic psilocybin as much as she did with the whole mushroom. But I think the jury's out on that a little bit. I think she was pretty tuned in. Um, and it's important to recognize all the clinical trials that use synthetic psilocybin. People I know who are either psychonauts or researchers who have tried and worked with both the whole organic biomass and the synthetic compound say it is equivalent. I've never had synthetic psilocybin, so I can't really speak to it. Um, but again, just a point. Um, but we can see we've dated the use of this sacramental use in, Mes uh, in Mesoamerica at least to 500 BC. And I'm going to show you pictographs uncovered in Spanish caves that go back even 30,000 years. So, uh, Richard Evan Schultes, just to give a shout out if you're interested in this field, the world's kind of leading ethnobotanist, really brought us awareness of ayahuasca as well as Tiana and Cottle, one of the wondrous mushrooms. So, just a little shout out to Schultes there at the bottom. Uh, Wade Davis's book, One River, if you haven't read, if you haven't read One River. If you haven't, make sure you read it if you're interested in this field. Uh, it's not only a Canadian treasure, but he does a great job of, of explaining both ayahuasca and, and, and mushrooms, uh, the history and how our knowledge of these came to be, the original cultural application, the indigenous histories, that kind of thing. So you can see, this is kind of what we know. You're going to see a lot of reference to Carhart Harris. Everybody's familiar with Robert Carhart Harris. 
young, brilliant neuroscientist from um, you know, Imperial College uh, in London, UK. They even tell me what Carhart Harris did his master's in, because he's now known as a neuroscientist. But the important thing about Carhart Harris, what did he do his master's in? Yes. Oh, uh, was it like the fractal dimensions of consciousness? Uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> you should do your master's in that. That's awesome. Uh, so I, okay, any other guesses? I love that. Freud. Oh, Freudian psychoanalysis. Oh, yeah, Freudian psychoanalysis. So the important thing to recognize about Carter Harris is he learned neuroscience under David Nutt's lab, preeminent neuroscientist. So it's it's legit. He's taught himself neuroscience. Came out of this as a Freudian. And if you look at Carter Harris's um, large picture explanations of the brain and of consciousness, there's a very clear um, signature of Freudian thinking. So we're going to get to that in a little bit, but just get. So he's an interesting guy, but we know that psilocybin, he's done a lot of brain imaging. So fMRI screening, uh, old imaging. So he's done brain imaging with people under psilocybin, under LSD, and other psychoactives. And he's written a ton of articles. He's extremely prolific, extremely brilliant. He's a rock star in this, in this area these days. And so he's given us conceptual tools to explain the psychedelic state. And his interest in psychedelics is to understand the neural correlates to consciousness. So the physical underpinning to what's going on in a spiritual or an awareness level, what's the physiological, neurological underpinning, what's happening, what is leading to these experiences, and what's correlated on a physiological level. So you can see he's really quite famous for popularizing this notion of the default mode network, which was not necessarily his uh, conjecture, but he's popularized it. Default mode network is this kind of network or a hub of various brain regions that kind of work together to establish your normal filter of waking consciousness. It's thought to be the seed of your ego, and I explain a bit more about the default mode network. But one of the things we know a lot because of his research and other folks is while psilocybin leads to an increase in glucose utilization, it decreases cerebral blood flow to certain parts of your brain. And I remember when I started reading this neuroscience, that blew my mind that it actually was creating a decrease in, a, in blood flow, oxygenation, and electrical activity in certain parts of your brain. Because if you had psilocybin, you would think it's just this global increase of this this massive connectivity, and new energy, new ideas, but it gets there by suppressing the parts of your brain which suppress the parts of your brain which keep it from being always interconnected or always kind of a little more um, florid. So we're going to get in and explain that a little more. But it's about changing that functional, functional connectivity, a decoupling of activity between the medial prefrontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, the regions that comprise the DMT, the DMN get suppressed or quieted, and you know, you've seen this kind of image before of the interconnectivity of the regions of the brain. I'll show you that image in a sec. Uh, but you're going to see what happens is what he calls a more primary state of consciousness occurs. He has a, a great paper about the entropic brain. Entropy is uncertainty. There's those elements of randomness where you don't necessarily, you can't predict what's going to happen. And that's a key concept we're talking about. The phenomenology of the psilocybin experience is this notion of entropy, and we'll return to that as well. So Nichols, people know Dave Nichols, leading LSD researcher and chemist of the States, brilliant man. He spoke at Mapping the Minds as well. It's amazing to hear him talk these days. So he has identified your serotonin receptors, 5-HT2A, as a key site of action. Uh, what happens is you have novel patterns of global neurological internal connectivity produced by psilocybin when combined with the right set and setting. So people are familiar with set and setting. This is, again, to give Tim Leary his due. Um, he kind of went off the rails at some point, uh, but he really started the Harvard Psilocybin Project. He is the one who originally uh, acknowledged the role of setting in the psychedelic experience. A lot of the early research was done, you administered psilocybin or LSD to someone in a hospital setting, kind of strapped to a bed under fluorescent lights, and uh, surprise, surprise, it created a kind of psychotic type state because it's a horrible place to be. And, Feel like you imagine being hypersensitive and hypersuggestible when you're in a hospital with people poking and prodding and super bright. So yes, people didn't do well. Um, but he went on to acknowledge the role of setting in the psychedelic experience, and that's the context, the rituals involved, the um, the space, who's in it, the preparation, how the space is appointed, what you're doing, and all that. So he's kind of reinfused this notion of ceremony, which in Western culture we've lost. We've lost our rites of passage. We've lost a sense of ceremony. I think this is there's a whole history of kind of when we got removed from the land, the witch hunts, the move from agriculture-based societies to modern industrial societies. We lost a lot of our ability to understand and work with herbs and plant medicines. We lost a lot of our ceremony. If you've 
you've ever read Steve Jenkinson, who's Canada's leading writer on death, his great book called Die Wise, if you're interested. He says a couple things. Is, is you know we have a death phobic culture and a grief illiterate culture, and the reason is we've lost connection with our ancestors. That middle passage when the colonial powers took people from Europe and we came here, took and, and I forgot to do a landing acknowledgement to begin to acknowledge the indigenous people who were here before us. Uh, but that middle passage we lost in terms of Western culture, connection with ancestry, connection with our own cultural roots. We don't have a lot of modern ceremonies, maybe even your driver's license at 16 is kind of a, a coming of age passage. We don't have a lot of vision quests. So acknowledging the role of setting is reinfusing the understanding that ceremony and ritual is part of what is the power of these medicines. Uh, but we do know that um, psilocybin uh, research on healthy volunteers has been linked to sustained over time, now measured 16 months, 24 months, these gains are maintained, often improved over time, improvements in attitude, mood, and behavior, um, and positive correlations with uh, personality traits of absorption, people were like, you absorbed it into experiences tend to do better in psychedelic experiences, um, but people have positive mystical type experiences, and we do know that it reduces um, uh, depression and anxiety. And we do know that the, the personality trait of neuroticism is associated with difficult psychedelic experiences. And if you look at the microdosing literature, microdosing and psilocybin and other classic psychedelics has been shown to increase neural you know, creativity, problem solving, focus, uh, but it can also incre increase traits of neuroticism. And if people have microdosed, anyone put your hand? It's a pretty open audience here. Uh, I know, and I microdosed for about eight months straight, trying to really get to know psilocybin. So, so, using a lot of different kind of formulas and, and kind of schedules. But there was no doubt if you if you don't get the dosing right, and you're you're moving from that sub perceptual into perceiving the effect of the dose, and you're trying to function in daily life, um, you do get a little bit neurotic because you're thinking more about how you're interacting with the world. I find if you microdose, you really need to be strong in your spiritual practice. And I think that's one of the most important things about microdosing is it, 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 it primes you well for improved spiritual practice, whether that's meditation or whatever kind of activities people uh, perform to kind of refine their consciousness and their focus. Um, but it is interesting just on the subject of neuroticism that um, uh, microdosing can be associated with the increase of neuroticism. So. Uh, okay, too much more into this, but we know the importance of set which is your personality and your mindset. So when I do my drug teaching in Queens, I talk about addiction. Uh, I talk about a book um, by a wonderful physician named uh, uh, Norman Zimberg, who wrote a book called Drug Set and Setting. He looks at all the American men, and they were primarily men in the Vietnam War, who were deconscripted and sent to fight in Vietnam, and a number of them became addicted to heroin. When they got brought back to the United States three years later, less than 12% of the people addicted to heroin were still addicted to heroin. So it shows the importance of setting. If we want to treat addiction or mental health issues, we need to change people's setting. Um, but also set, and set is your own set of expectations. And you've probably seen this, I think cannabis is a classic example. I do look at cannabis as a psychedelic because of its consciousness amplification and the generalized disruption of the brain that it causes. And for a lot of people, they get anxious under cannabis, particularly the young people that I work with, primarily because they're smoking super high THC with no CBD strains of cannabis, which is not recommended. There's a great publication um, uh, called the Low Risk Cannabis Use Guidelines, which a friend of mine, Benedict Fisher, put together. He said it's on the Fraser. It's brilliant. It's how to use cannabis well and properly. And you want a combination of CBD and THC. It's my little, my little pet peeve here. The high dose THC stuff, 24% THC, no CBD, causes a lot of anxiety, a lot of bad trips for people. It's not natural for the plant. Those are hybrid strains that have been manipulated to do that. Cannabis historically always had CBD and CHC. You want, in my opinion, 14, 16%, 8% CBD. It's the relationship between the two that conditions the experience. But with cannabis, sorry, that was an aside. With cannabis, you really do see the, the importance of someone's set. So there are expectations. Um, their psychology, their fears, their understanding of how the drug will affect them are part of what conditions the drug effect. So drug is one thing, the pharmacology of the drug. The set, which is your mindset, your trauma history, and all your expectations you bring, uh, and then setting. So it's always the interaction of the three. You think of it as a triad. Uh, well, that's a lot. So what do we know about psilocybin? Yeah, it's about all the information, but uh, this is a scientist group, so I had to appear scientific here. Uh, psilocybin alters procedural constancies of the visual field. So one of the things about these 5-HT2AR agonists is they create visions and your occipital lobe and all your visual cortex, everything in your brain that is active when you're literally seeing things in the physical world is as active with your eyes closed. So it's seeing real things to the brain. 
And that's why this notion of hallucinations and comes into context. But first of all, we know it alters what you see and it, and, and it creates visions even with the eyes closed. Primate studies on psychedelics are uncommon. We do know that there's low levels of toxicity and abuse potential. Um, psychedelics, they bypass the dopamine reward system, which really is the hallmark of addiction. So that's part of the reason they're not necessarily as addictive as other drugs. And also, if you had psychedelics and you had uh, ayahuasca or extensive psilocybin, you know that these experiences can be extremely difficult. And that's the thing. They're not all glory and God. You have to kind of often work to get there. And often they're very difficult experiences for people. And you may come out of it, or in the middle of it, you're often like, oh my God, I'm never doing this again. Mm -hmm. Until the afterglow the next day, like that was amazing. Because things come together. But you have to fall apart to come together. And that's part of what these things kind of do. But we know that there's weak reinforcement. Um, they don't engender self-administration animals. They don't necessarily go back to it. Low doses have been proven to extinguish acute fear conditioning. Uh, and a result in hippocampal neurogenesis. So psychedelics have been shown to create neurogenesis. Ayahuasca not only increases serotonin transporter efficacy, efficacy but it's been shown to create new cellular matter. Um, so you have all sorts of interesting things here. And we do think that as much as 5-HT2A is the main receptor, we do think these psychedelics act on other parts of the brain. And there's other systems involved, but we just don't know about it yet. And I do want to point out that it's not just the psilocybe mushrooms that are medicinal and that we should be studying. Lion's mane. Rishi, cordyceps, we have an entire range of medicinal mushrooms, many of which are nootropic or psychoactive as well. Um, there's an entire Buddhist cult in Japan that worships the lion's mane mushroom. The regalia is meant to mimic the natural botany of the, of the mushroom. So lion's mane is an important one. It's not just psilocybe, and I think the people getting involved in the mushroom companies are kind of getting hip to that. But these are emerging as novel treatments, particularly for inflammatory disorders. This is Dave Nichols and his son are really keen on this because we do know that they reduce neural inflammation. Uh, a lot of mental health disorders are, have neural, uh, neural inflammation implicit in them. And we do think that a number of even chronic pain, fibromyalgia, a lot of these other disorders, uh, other physiological systems that have to do with inflammation, psychedelics can have a potential in treating. So they're remarkable in that the, the one kind of substance of these molecules can treat a whole range of issues. So that's one of the uh, remarkable things. But we do know that serotonin helps us regulate sleep weight cycles, thermal regulation, your body heat, your appetite, sexual behavior, learning and memory, pain, motor activity, and aspects of your autonomic function. So obviously serotonin is implicit in a lot of human consciousness. Um, I wanted to talk about the phenomenology of the experience um, because I think that's super interesting and the more I talk about this, people want to know about this. How do we make it sense of what happens? What happens under psilocybin? How do you explain this? So the phenomenology, phenomenology for those who are familiar with the term, is just the study of the apparitions of consciousness, what appears, and treating the consciousness with a radical imperialism as real. So everything you experience is real. So the apparitions of consciousness, your awareness, and consciousness really is awareness of awareness. Phenomenology of consciousness is just the study of what happens. And you're trying to describe it to the things themselves, for Cyril would have said. So this is kind of, I don't know if this is kind of similar to what you would have seen in a psychedelic state. I find it hard to really find art that captures exactly what I see. I think we all kind of see and experience things that are unique to our perspective and, and, and our incarnation. But this obviously gets at the fractal dimension, the kind of seeing sentient, sentient beings, the colors, the synesthesia that can occur in these experiences, the blending of sensations. So um, you get fractal patterns, very similar to these spirals. It's always moving, moving, it's dynamic. People report being able to see in the dark or see apparitions of light. Patterns, visuals, encountering entities, going on journeys, traveling. And these are shamanic. When you look at the history of kind of these experiences, these are shamanic experiences. And it's really important if we're going to talk about psychedelics, we also understand shamanism and the history of shamanism. And I know in our culture, there's a taboo around shamanism, and we don't have a lot of lineages that continue to this day. But these plants have always been used in, within human history, within ceremonial settings and ritualist activity, led by ceremonialists or shamans who are experienced with and comfortable in these fields. Uh, the shamanic flight is a telltale experience of shamanism. If you're interested, Mircea Iliad's book on archaic techniques of ecstasy, the book on shamanism, talks about the importance of the soul flight. So these are kinds of things that we all experience, which traditionally go back to our very root of history, our root of spirituality, our root of religion. Um, it even predates Buddhism. Buddhism is the closest explanation. I can get to some of these states if you really study like uh, Vajrayana, or Tantra, uh, states of Samadhi, kind of explain the psychedelic state. 
but the Bon religion predated uh, Tibetan Buddhism and predating Bon with shamanism, shaman, uh, Bon is pseudo uh, shamanistic. So that shamanism is a direct, direct experience of spiritual disease. It's the direct religious experience, unmediated by a church or a priest or a text or words. It's your direct experience of the sacred. That's essentially what shamanism is. Again, just more cool pictures. Um, now onto the mushrooms. So these are some of the important species of psilocybe. This is from a Gaspar Guzman uh, article. You can see Zepatecorum, Mexicana, uh, Hispanica, so Azotecorum. So these are probably the original sacred mushrooms of Mexico, which were known as Tion and Nicajo. Um, it goes back into Inca, as well as Mayan civilizations, these mushrooms. They're going to talk about the Mesoamerican history of the mushroom cults and rituals. But here's, just to always remember, these are People are familiar, you know, the notion of, you know, fungi are not plants, right? You have three different kingdoms. I think it's so weird in terms of biology or botany. You have, you know, animals, you have plants, and then you have fungi. And the very interesting thing is fungi look and act in a genetic level are much more similar to animals than they are to plants. So there's this weird middle kingdom they occupy, which I think once we understand a little more about what they do, it kind of makes the indigenous groups that use them. So I think if we're going to... Uh, get more into understanding and working with psilocybin, and I love the clinical trials, I love where we're going with this as new potential therapies, but I came from the medical sector, I came from the health sector, and the one thing I want to encourage is that these just don't fall into the hands of pharmaceutical companies or doctors. Um, I think decriminalization should probably or will happen before even possibly they get approved for therapeutic application. We're all working, those of us who do the science on this, are trying to build the science <coughs> so that we can get the drug approved, get it licensed, get access, get it into the hands of therapists. But the reality is they may get decriminalized before all that happens, which then creates a totally different playing field. Um, kind of like it is now, but more out in the open. People have access, people have actually purchased philosophy. Um, if people are familiar with Mark Hayden's kind of public health framework on how to decriminalize, his argument is because these are very potent you shouldn't just have them freely available to everyone. People should have to do a weekend workshop, for example, before you get psilocybe so you know how to work with it. So how these come to market from a policy perspective is going to be the challenge of the next couple of years. But um, my feeling is the Liberal government, now that cannabis is a bit of a mess, but it's kind of settling in. Now that they've been reelected, I think you're going to see decriminalization, I think, within three years. You're definitely going to see clinical trials this year. You're going to see an evolution of science. Um, but this is just to say they may fall into the hands of psychotherapists and doctors which I think if they do that, we need to be clear how to use them and the role of other health professionals like therapists and psychologists and counselors in preparation and integration. We don't want them just prescribed by doctors, I don't think. But you can see here, this is the cultural application. And as much as the curanderas were the doctors of, of their people, um, these are cultural tools um, that have always been implicit in the communities. Have always, people have always sought them out for um, the experiences they provide and the healing experiences. So I think we need to be careful as things unfold in the next few years, where they go, and always acknowledge the ceremonial, ritualistic origin of these over history, and in particular, the Mexican and Mesoamerican First Peoples who really developed these modalities. So where we go with all this is going to be interesting, but these are just some of the issues at hand. Uh, I love mushroom art, and I love the statues and the stones. So you're going to see a bunch of cool pictures. These are all from Central and South America. These are the Mayan mushroom stones. And if you ever get a chance, really, really look at these and study them. Like, I know you're just seeing them on a slide here, but look at the facial expressions. Look at the eyes. Look at the halos over the head. Um, you're going to kind of see this is you know, actually get, it's carrying his head down here. So you can see the telltale kind of eyes, what happens in dilation. You get a mushroom there. You get lots of snake imagery. You get lots of bird imagery. So it's super interesting in terms of the iconography of the mushroom experience. These are ones I've only recently discovered and I love. But look at these. These are all kind of people. These are, again, these are relics. These are archaeological re relics that have been uncovered and then kind of rebuilt. And you can see here, what I like about these is, obviously, it's a mushroom cult. They're all kind of sitting, and I don't mean cult in a negative way. I mean in terms of ritualistic worship. And you got, we have four of them or five of them all kind of in a circle, four of them. They get snakes kind of coming out their head. Serpents are obviously a symbol of, of sacredness. Um, it goes back both in Judea and Christian, but also lots of shamanic. Um, History is there, but the snake combined with the bird, you know, something that's both of the earth and winged to the heavens, has always been that sacred union. You see that represented here. But look at the way there's four people, they're all holding each other, right? Look at that, that interconnectedness. And I'm sure if you've been in ayahuasca ceremonies or deep psilocybin healing work, the interconnectedness you feel with other people, 
that sense of transpersonality, of connecting, almost being able to read each other's minds, or being deeply grateful for each other and realize each other, we hold each other, we're not separate beings, we're radically dependent on each other. And you can see, I, I like the way that's kind of celebrated in these. So I like these kind of statues here for that reason. Um, these ones here are from the Codex, uh, and this is an Inca piece in the bottom right. But look at the wings here on the bottom, on the back here. And this is the notion of flight, the importance of, of uh, because there's a shamanic journey, and it's a classic flight of consciousness where people can travel through space or time or see distant cities. This is telltale phenomenology. But this notion that you know that we have things, that we can't fly, that we can have an elevated perspective on things, that we don't always see things up close, we can get a bigger picture worldview, and that we can have movement. And that particularly is it's hugely appealing to people facing death. Because we don't, as a culture, have a great story for what happens when we die. And we don't have a great story in, in most of our cultures of where we come from. So you can kind of see the way in which the, the worship of these medicines, the worship of these plants, gives us a connection with something bigger than ourselves, helps us explain key kind of times in, in kind of human life. Um, and you can kind of see the role of the shaman here um, in this kind of context as well. So anyways, this is some interesting thing there. Um, and if you haven't read any Richard Evans Schultes, this is a classic quote that I really like. It kind of explains where he comes from. When the unearthly and inexplicably weird physical and psychic effects of the few plants were experienced, it did not take long for early societies to regard them as sacred elements. So you have to, again, if you're out and you're following some cattle and you see a mushroom in a dung pile and you go to eat it, and you know what I mean, you eat a couple of them, and the next thing, you imagine early kind of humans having this kind of radical experience. How do you make sense of that? For a lot of uh, theorists, we believe that was our original spiritual or religious kind of experience. There's a, connect, a sense of connectivity beyond our normal kind of boundaries. And this notion of communication with spirits in the outer world, uh, outer realms, other dimensions of consciousness, and connection with ancestors. So you can kind of see how, in these times now, particularly with climate change and the loss of flora and fauna, how important it is to reconnect with these kind of phenomena. This is from a newspaper article. There was, um, I think in the 50s, Wasson had helped curate um, uh, a museum uh, display on the mushroom cults of Mexico. And I think one of the things, if we're going to kind of look at uh, uh, mushroom rituals and the traditions, um, Wade Davis has a really good account of some of the mushroom ceremonies from the 30s and 40s in Mexico before they got kind of more westernized. Uh, but you can see here, I'll just read in case you can't see it. So, such stuff as dreams are made of, articles used in vision-inducing rites at Walla de Jimenez, which is in the Oaxaca area of Mexico, uh, are sold by this woman. Among the, can among the items which are used ritualistically are candles, which I think makes sense to us, light in the darkness, soft light, incense, the smells, uh, beans, and a goose egg. Does anyone know the, why beans or a goose egg would have been used in these rituals? <coughs> yeah. I think goose eggs were thought of as like containers for negative energy. Totally, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, and beans as well were used. Uh, often the curandero would throw them in order to get a divination or a prognosis for the patient. So when we're getting into this and looking at the use of, of philosophy in therapeutic settings, we have to understand that cultural history was magical religious, and it was meant for divination. It was meant for people to see things we don't normally see. And if you have to imagine the shaman is on a high dose of psilocybin, um, visual or much brighter sound, is much cleaner, um, perceptions are elevated. Um, there's a notion of being able to see things we don't see in normal waking consciousness, which may be because of the heightening of the senses, but we also know they create states of hyper-excitability, hyper-suggestibility as well, so you're more likely to kind of uh, agree with a cultural explanation given to you or the words of the shaman in these states because you're more suggestible. So, but you know, eggs and beans aren't part of the Johns Hopkins trials, as you know. So there's a cultural element that we're losing as we're, we're taking it and applying it into medicine. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but I'm just acknowledging it's a shift from the traditional usage. And I think when you read about the original mushroom ceremonies, people will be quite surprised, often A, that often the patients weren't getting psilocybin, it was a cure and error only. And what they were doing was traveling into the future or the past or the place where all was known to see how the patient would do. And they would come back and, and pronounce the, the kind of um, the verdict or the prognosis and give some, some uh, cleaning or purification rituals to the patient, send them away. But it was the patient's belief in the cure and error that mattered. The fact that this person was seen as something exceptional, connected to something bigger, was a pipeline to truth or to God. That's what the patient kind of depended on, relied. And the culture would use various tools, including eggs, removal of, of, of 
negative energy beans for the purpose of divination. So it's just, it's a different cultural history, and so we're using it now, let's acknowledge it and figure out where we want to go with more magical religious aspects of these things. Um, so if, if you're interested in the history of, of psychoactive plants, uh, Elisa Gurudoche is one of my favorite writers. She hasn't written a lot, but her articles are amazing and dense. And she really shows the lifelong, in terms of human history, fascination of psychoactive plants. Again, it goes back at least 60,000 years. I'm going to talk about some of the rituals we know about. Um, we know that it's only recently we're beginning to understand the historical and cultural context, so I just want to give her credit. These are our cave paintings from either Spain or France. I'm kind of all over in these. I don't know if you can see here, but you can see the mushrooms all along here. And you can see cattle over there. Um, so these are thought to be 30,000 years old. So there's something in terms of, if you have to think about what early tribal or human societies would choose to paint on a cave painting, was generally very symbolic, important things. First of all, they had to get the ochre to do this. It was very ritualized how it was done. And we have lasting evidence today of mushroom worship that goes back to urban early human history. So it's, it's not a surprise we're rediscovering. Now, you can see here more mushroom rituals. And you're starting to see these kind of wild looking, almost like extraterrestrial beings or spirits. You're starting to see early kind of pictorial representations of shamanism, people who seem to have some connection to the spiritual realm, often with the kind of halo of light or fractal patterns around their head. One of the early kind of pictorial representations of a shaman, you can see it's very human in its form, but it has animal elements and horns. Um, again, more issues of mushrooms and shamanism there. And then my favorite, this is the bee shaman. Um, this is a bow, it was found probably at about 6,000 before Common Era. Um, and you can kind of see here, it's part human, part bee. It's covered in mushrooms, it's got mushrooms all in the exterior of the body, coming out of its hands. It's got the face of a bee, that kind of pattern that you often see under psychedelics as well, through the body. And this is called the bee shaman. And you may know that uh, mushrooms, when they were dried, would often be stored in honey. So there's some sort of synergistic connection between honey and, and mushrooms, which goes back into ancient times. Um, this is uh, Persephone and Demeter. Are people familiar with Kaikion and the Eleusinian uh, mysteries? So people familiar with Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. Did you know that once a year they would have gone to a psychedelic festival, which they could never speak about outside of it, and they would have been given a psychoactive substance which would have blown their mind? And most people in Roman and Greek societies would have done this. That, this, that right lasted for 2,000 years. 2,000 years people go and drink Kaikion, which is a special brew. Various conjectures on what it contained, but very clearly here there's a mushroom being passed over, so it's thought that it was partly. Uh, mushroom based, it could have been ergot based. Um, an ergot, LSD, is a chemical synthetic version of a natural ergot, which is like a fungus thing that grows on rye and psychedelic properties. Kaikyak could have contained an ergot. A lot of early theories would have contained cannabis, ephedra, or opium as well. But all we know is you would go, and it was considered sacred, it was once a year. Anybody who's anybody would, would go, you could never talk about it outside of it. It was overseen by priests, and it was considered sacred, and you would definitely have a psychoactive experience over a period of a week. So isn't that amazing to think that that's where Plato, Aristotle, the great thinkers of Western society, that was never taught to us when we you know, did first year philosophy, was it? Or the history of Western civilization, that some of our greatest thoughts and ideas came from psychoactive plants. Now, a lot of us would have historically seen that as a weakness, but it's not. We're always enmeshed with the natural world. Where do your thoughts come from? You're really not responsible. They come from nowhere. They come out of the void into your head, right? So, you know, inspiration. Is, there's always things outside of ourselves. Um, Alex Gray, if you like his art, this is the stone ape theory. So there's something about uh, psilocybin and language. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about semantic priming, the way psilocybin can allow us to make connections in a way that our waking normal consciousness can't in the same fluidity. Um, again, Terence McKenna's theory in Stone Gate was that a philosophy mushroom was the birth of language, led to incredible advances in culture, the birth of spirituality, and this is Alex Gray's representation of that. You can see speaking the spirit, the eyes are lit, you know, it's, it's remarkable. Um, okay, so Carhartt Harris, we're going to get, uh, how are we doing for time? We're good? We're good? Okay. Uh, so Carhartt Harris' most recent article, which he wrote with Carl Brisbane, is called Rebus and the Anarchic Brain. I didn't even know this had come out. I'm just kind of doing my own thing, and the students in my lab one day were talking about this. I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, haven't you read the new Carhartt Harris? So it's a, it's, it's a tough read, super interesting, but his, this is the abstract from it. But his new theory, and he wrote this paper with Carl Friston, who really is um, 
associated with the notion of the free energy principle, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But they wrote this article together. REBA stands for Relaxed um, Beliefs Under Psychedelics. So their argument, if you just want to, I know you can't read the whole abstract quickly here, um, but with a, they have a new model for explaining what happens under psychedelics. And essentially, it's, it's this notion that, at the end, first of all, the anarchic brain means it's governed from the bottom up and not top down. So the default mode network, the seat of your ego, structures normal perception. And it basically takes the past and from a Bayesian influence in the future, and any of you are programmers or coders, you kind of know this, neuroscience and coding are kind of really coming together, really interesting information theories and neuroscience are kind of coming together. But essentially, this in a nutshell argues that the normal brain takes from the past, it infers from that into the future, and projects almost ahead of time what you're going to see, experience, and feel. Because it's going from the past to minimize risk and uncertainty, and to minimize the frivolous use of brain energy, or oxygen, or blood flow, or electroactivity. It simplifies things. This is Huxley's restrictive health that he talked about. So the idea is that psychedelics will relax the normal hierarchical or top-down um, distribution of meaning where things are kind of prefigured and it relaxes that out of the psychedelic state and you get more bottom-up sensory input, more bottom-up brain uh, neurological connectivity from other parts of the brain that are normally quieted or aren't connected with each other. So you have this anarchic brain in a condition of entropy or uncertainty and you have relaxed beliefs so people can experience things that they can't otherwise experience and then when the brain resets as the drug wears off the thought is not just that after the period afterwards but as things realign your interpretive structures don't go back to what they do what they did before there's something very deep and if you know about memory formulation and long-term potentiation uh, as part of why trauma is so debilitating is because it's stored as a very deep memory and it's because you've, you've, you've got a very you've got an elevated state associated emotions with this memory, which then gets filed in a certain way that keeps it very current. What this relaxed expert beliefs under psychedelics model proposes is that what psychedelics do is it quiets that hierarchical, predetermined decision making of what you're perceiving and who you are and what you're experiencing. And it gives this condition of a primal state of consciousness or a primary state of consciousness where there's novel connections, novel insights. Uh, that's also part of why it can be difficult for people, because they lose their construct of meaning. That's the death of the ego. That's that ego dissolution you read about, where people literally feel like they're falling apart. I don't know if you've people been in ceremony before where you see people really struggling and they get lost, because they're trying to always go back to pre-existing states of who they thought they are. But what psychedelics do is they give us an opportunity to rewrite our understanding of who we are and our conclusions about the world. So, it's a, I'm not doing the article uh, great justice, but it's an important one to at least reference here. Uh, a little bit more about Carhart Harris. It's important to understand the notion of entropy or uncertainty. Psychedelics create these entropic states, which are good for your brain. If you're doing the same predictable stuff all the time, your synaptic pathways are very entrenched. They're not very um, well branched out. They're not very diverse. So, we want to challenge ourselves with uncertain experiences, because that's how we grow. That's a state of criticality. But entropy is important for uh, neuroplasticity. It's important for psychological growth. Um, he's interested in the kind of underlying states to these consciousness. Uh, free energy principle I'm going to talk about in a minute. The default mode network I've referenced. He's very much Freudian, so he talks about the default mode network as the seat of the ego. Your ego is what mediates your experience of yourself in the world. Uh, it's based on your understanding of memory, history, assumptions about who you are, high-level decisions about your own self-worth, and that kind of stuff, which is exactly the psychedelics relax, so you can have overcome that sense of ego. Um, but he really is interested in psychedelics because of what he teaches about the, the brain. This is a summary of some of his work, and I'll just go through this quickly. Uh, you, obviously, what psilocybin does is it decreases activation in certain cortical hubs, such as your anterior and posterior cingulate cortices and thalamus as well as the medial prefrontal cortex. So the intensity of the subjective effects of the patient experience or your experience under psilocybin of the drugs correlates with the magnitude of that deactivation. So in people when you brain imagery, if we saw a lot of deactivation of those couplings, they would have more powerful subjective experiences. They'd report mystical type experiences. So functional connectivity analysis revealed an uncoupling of activity between these different brain regions, both part of the default, default mode network. Default mode network was historically known as the task negative network. So if you're not thinking about doing any applied activity, it's the part of your brain that's regulating your consciousness. Very hierarchical. Uh, and you can kind of see um, the way in which uh, psychedelics kind of disrupt that. 
So there's a decrease in the, in the anti-correlation between the default mode network and several other kind of networks. Um, so what you see is it reduces the differentiation between brain networks and produces a disorganized brain state. That's this notion of entropy, which I wanted to kind of get at. Won't go too much into this. So the default mode network, uh, again, the brain, because it consumes so much energy and oxygen is so important, the body is going to kind of minimize risk to it, so it's going to kind of keep it as simple as possible. Uh, there's an area of dense connectivity in the default <coughs> mode network. It's the highest level of functional hierarchy in the brain. It's considered the, the conductor or the captain of the brain. And you can kind of see it's this large-scale uh, interaction of different brain networks or functional hubs. And so the nice thing about Carr and Harris is he's allowed us, instead of just looking at receptors and molecules, he takes a step back and he's looking at the ecosystem of the brain. The way it operates as a self-organizing intelligence system with different hubs, uh, networks, uh, all kind of interconnected with each other. So it's not so much molecular anymore. Systemic or ecological is the way I like to see it. So these primary states that psychedelics create are they're, they're almost primitive or childlike, they're pre-ego because the ego is dissolved. There's a little bit of transition from normal consciousness into something different. And then what happens is that's the state of primary consciousness. Secondary consciousness are kind of when you're a little bit more removed as we get older, the weight of experience. What we do is we generalize from all of our experiences in the past and we kind of condition the future by assumptions based on what we've experienced in the past. So most of us activate, uh, walk around with what he would call secondary consciousness. We're not really present. In the, in the moment in the same way, because we're all making assumptions about what's going to happen based on it. To predict what's going to happen in the future, that's what the brain does. And so what they're basically arguing is that the brain uh, does this, and in this way it simplifies consciousness. If you are familiar with this, this is probably the most widely shown <laughs> slide on psychedelics. I, I, I was at a conference on ayahuasca and religion, and they showed this, and I'm like, it's not even ayahuasca. But it's, it's, it's famous. Um, this is from one of Carhartt or, or I should say, so I should have a citation at the bottom, I don't know if it got cut out. But it's, it's a simple explanation for those of you who don't see it. This is the, the placebo brain, this is the, the brain of a subject who's on psilocybin, this is your brain on drugs, <laughs> not, the, not the egg in the fry pan. And the brain really doesn't look like this, it's a pictorial representation. The one thing I will say, just a little asterisk on Carhartt or work. FMRI imaging, for <coughs> anyone ever done FMRI imaging? Work with FMRI machines. So my understanding, I've never done it directly, but people I talk to a lot about it say there's so much static in an FMRI image, there's a lot of art in terms of pulling out the figure into the foreground from the background. So just like this, your brain doesn't look like this, but they've created a picture of representation to make a point. So there's a lot of interpretation in this brain science, which is fair enough because brain science is still new. So th these are the various, you can see various regions of the brain kind of mostly communicate with each other. There's a lot of intertalk and not a lot of crosstalk. So what happens is psilocybin is all that gets disrupted. You have a lot of long cross-coupling strands. You see this? This part of the brain is now suddenly talking to this brain, which previously it hardly did at all. So you get a saturation of connectivity. So this this is actually in the. Anyone read Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind? Yeah, he's he's pretty good at summarizing Carver Harris, and this shows up in that book as well. So what happens? in the psilocybin state. This is what we're all interested in. What's the phenomenology? This is from the Rebus and Anarchic Brain. This is or just this is classic Harvard Harris. I don't know what the guy's like in person, but he must read more than anyone I know when he just cite literature like this. So this is a summary of a lot of the documentation of differing psychological experiences that happen in the psilocybin state. So ego dissolution, we know, where your normal sense of identity dissolves. You may feel different or transcend your sense of self. You may not feel like you have a sense of self. You may feel absorbed in something in front of you or in the experiences around you. So it's ego dissolution. Uh, unitive and, and so on as peak experience, the, the sense of mystical unity or oneness, either with others or the natural world. Near-death experiences, people feel like they're dying. is not uncommon in, in kind of psilocybin. A sense of anxiety and uncertainty. So transient anxiety is one of the known side effects in the psilocybin clinical trials. It was, it was never to the point that it questioned the safety of the trials. But somewhere around 40% of people in the clinical trials report transient uh, anxiety and distress. And that's where your preparation comes in, that's where the role of the therapist comes in, to kind of coach people <coughs> how to get through that period. The classic statement is, you know, let go and surrender. You know, don't kind of fight, just kind of go with the flow of things. But people do have states of anxiety and uncertainty that is quite problematic. Uh, heightened suggestibility, we know. And if you read anything, if people are familiar with Marlena Dobkin de Rios, one of the mothers of ayahuasca research, she's not necessarily in vogue anymore, but her early work in the 60s and 70s is pretty brilliant. She's writing up to the 90s. And her argument is that psychedelics create a state of hypersuggestibility, which is why historically ayahuasca was always used with children and teenagers. 
in indigenous cultures. That for the Western mind, we're like, whoa, kids and drugs, but that's the way in which teenagers, as if you have teenagers, you know teenagers, they feel a disconnection from their culture. So the ayahuasca ceremonies were, particularly in hunting societies, were meant to give better visual acuity and hearing. Shamans would embody the movement of the panther, for example, or whatever the, the prey was, so that people get more connected to the natural world. Then they're out hunting after ayahuasca with heightened sensitivity, so they're better hunters. Uh, but also with group bonding. It's a cultural bonding. I don't know if you've been through ayahuasca ceremony. You, you feel so close with people afterwards. And psilocybin creates the same thing. So that the notion of heightened suggestibility is important. And so, you know, we've got to recognize that sensitivity to context. Uh, your surrounding serotonin expression is cued to your environment. So it's not just singular contained in yourself. And I remember just kind of back in the opiate world, when we were trying to figure out the factors going into all these overdoses, one of the things we covered in the literature was the notion that if you're, a, you, if you're an opiate user and you're, you're dependent on opiates and you're, you have tolerance, if you use in an unfamiliar situation, you're more likely to overdose than if you live, than use in a familiar situation. Which is if you believe in molecular tolerance and tolerance is tolerance, it blows your mind. How can it be different, the same dose be different? And that's because so much of our our, our neurophysiology is tied to context and it's tied to environmental surroundings. And that's something we're only really beginning to explore. So we have sensitivity to context, emotional ability, changes in emotional states, insight, people feel that there's this noetic quality, like they're experiencing something meaningful or insightful, and because they're in an elevated state, that's a deep memory that gets encoded there too. Paranoid and delusional thinking, I haven't seen a lot of that, but that certainly can happen. Psychological age regression, people having um, early birth matrix type experiences like Roth's work or, or experiencing past lives or, or their own birth, Re uh, magical thinking, vivid autobiographical collection, altered time perception, sense of the ineffable, a sense of presence of God but you can't quite explain it, entity encounters, encountering spirits, encountering the face or the presence of ayahuasca or the voice of the mushroom, experiencing some sort of knowledge that's coming from these entities, uh, enclosed dream-like visions with the eyes closed, uh, and geometric hallucinations uh, and, and those kind of patterns which are learned. So those are some of the subjective phenomena which have been documented within the kind of literature. Other reported experiences, greater feelings of openness, connectivity, enhanced meaning, reframing autobiography, uh, reduced depression, and you have this reset experience. People feel better afterwards. And the pathological patterns of our habituated thought and our rumination have kind of been shifted. Be able to look at something. What are the clinical outcomes? General themes we found in all this kind of game, back to the phenomenology, exalted feelings of joy, bliss, and love, embodiment, uh, alterations to identity, a movement of, from separateness to togetherness or interconnectedness, which really is the theme in all this, interconnectedness. Uh, experiences of transient psychological distress, parents of loved ones, people experience a lot of forgiveness or kind of overcoming uh, anger, uh, sharing experiences post-treatment, you can kind of, kind of see. So, including lasting changes, a sense of identity, synesthesia, which is a blending of senses, catharsis of powerful emotion, improved relationships after treatment, surrender, letting go of old issues or problems, forgiveness, and then again, a continued struggle to integrate experiences. So integration, is, as we know, is quite key in all this. So this is something I just want to introduce because I think this is a novel contribution I haven't seen cited in the literature a lot. Um, but this gentleman, and I think this is his name, and I can't find any, he did his PhD, as Caleb Smith, Caleb Smith. Um, and he was in the States, and he wrote this brilliant article, if you can find it, I've got a copy here, uh, called uh, Modeling the Flesh of God, Semantic Hyperpriming and the Tiana Cabo Cult of Mexico. So essentially what he argues is that psilocybin creates a state of hypersensitive perception and hyperprimed cognition, and that combined with the neurological spreading activation model, which I'll explain, alters your faculty of attention. So what he's trying to do is, 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 is do two things. Look at what we know in the modern science on psilocybin, and what the religious history was in, in, in the Mesoamerican traditions, the shamanic experience. And, and he does a really good, good, good job kind of blending the two worlds. So part of what he argues is, you know, this common reported rush of thoughts and interconnected thoughts with psilocybin, he tries to make sense of why this kind of happens. And he talks about something called indirect semantic priming. And this ecstatic state is a shamanic state, and the spreading activation model is this neuronal avalanching that happens as different brain regions all kind of begin to get connected. But I'm going to show you the next quote here because it helps understand this. Okay, so we've kind of got over this. Okay, so this is what I like here. So Spritzer is, is someone who talks about this semantic priming. So semantic priming is you've preloaded your assumption. When you hear a word, if you've been preconditioned to think about things associated with that word, you make the connection faster. You've been primed to make a connection, for example, between lemon and sour. 
But to go from lemon to sweet is even another reach. So his argument is that what psilocybin does is it creates enhanced hyper-indirect priming so that when you make an association, you can very quickly make seven degrees of association. And so you can go here to use our previous example. Um, okay, I'll just read it. What Spritzer's research was able to show was that an individual under the influence of psilocybin is able to associate distantly related concepts like sweet and lemon, again, normally it'd be sour and lemon, uh, much more quickly than a sober person in an ordinary baseline state of consciousness. In addition to being able to relate ideas they do not typically relate more quickly and easily, the psilocybin enabled participants to associate extraordinarily distant concepts with one another. To use our previous example, the hyperpriming state of the ecstatic uh, mushroom, shaman, would allow them to quickly relate lemon to citrus, to photosynthesis, to light, to sun, to the vibrant circulating energy and basis of life. So does that make sense now, this notion of priming and how we can make these, these, these radical connections in terms of associative kind of meaning under these psilocybin states? So that's important to realize interconnectedness in a culture which has broken our sense of connectedness and likes to see things as static and disconnected from each other. But quantum physics and quantum mechanics have shown that energy is more important than the particle. It's a field, so we're moving away from this notion, this Newtonian notion of separate things, into a field of interconnectivity. And psilocybin is simply allowing us to see that more clearly. So the sudden surge of priming volume measured in the psilocybin experience, so now he's talking about if you have a lot of channels and you put more water in it, how the water flows faster and bigger, right? So that's what's happening in psilocybin. It can be conceptualized as a flooding inlet of attention. The pupils dilating in a state of hyper-awareness and hyper-vigilance, the whole nervous system buzzing with vibrant sensation, the eyes allowing more light information to shine inwards from the surroundings, spring neuronal activation and reducing cerebral blood flow to areas of the brain responsible for inhibition. So the only parts of your brain that psilocybin is quieting are the parts of your brain that control, that hierarchically dictate from the top down, and that inhibit other parts of the brain. So you're getting a less inhibited brain. The filtering down of sensory information from consciousness to awareness. Anyways, I love it. I think it's a brilliant article. If you're interested, you can find that online. So what does psilocybin in practice, what does it look like? Most of the research is using moderate to high doses. I'm curious in low-dose applications. I'm curious in group setting applications. As you saw earlier, the clinical trials are all one-on-one. -on -one. It's singular. There's nothing group. There's really no ceremony. I'm very curious what you can do with live music and not recorded music, what you can do in group settings. Um, but again, essentially now they're all bit decreasing sensory input. Uh, and then we're trying to make sense of kind of what happens here. But what do we know about best practices in psilocybin for those of you who self-practice or, or sit with other people in psilocybin and are interested? Dose is important. Um, I came from the medical community and from the opiates and methadone, you always start low and go slow. With psychedelics, often you want to get the right dose threshold, particularly if you're looking for a peak experience, so you want to not underduce the dose people where they kind of get stuck. You want to get a high enough dose if you're on the peak model. Um, the role of the guide is important, and we're already seeing certification and training programs uh, for therapists. Uh, the model is called PSI, Preparation Session Integration. Um, and we know that session variables intended to enhance inner vision and reduce external stimuli uh, are the way that these trials have kind of gone. And the strongest evidence of indications for end-of-life anxiety and depression, unipolar depression, and then self-regulatory disorders. So again, trust in the therapist and belief in the therapeutic model is very important. That's one of the confounding variables in all these trials. They don't really try to figure out how important is the role of the counselor or therapist. So for example, the Johns Hopkins trial, if you got to do 12 hours of sitting with Bill Richards, the beautiful human being, a gifted therapist, that's going to prompt you really well for an extraordinary psilocybin experience. So the role of the therapist is important. So what occurs, how are we trying to make sense of this? I'm just going to propose a model and then I'm, I'm done. So I know I've been kind of rambling here for a while. But I've been interested in, in, in the comparison of this with meditative states and my interest in kind of yoga history and states of samadhi or states of zazen, states of, um, of insight and of clarity and of awareness. I think the psychedelic states create something very similar to what you'll find in yoga traditions. So both of them have something in common. There's a bracketing of normal consciousness that's kind of put on hold. There's a loss of your normal sense of self. There's an expanded state of unitive or connective consciousness. And then there's lasting and abiding changes in mood, thought, and behavior. Um, the psychedelic journey is important to recognize. It's like this hero's journey. You know, we need to understand the stages of these things. There's always a beginning, a middle, and an end. We know that vision and travel is part of the importance of these experiences, the hero's journey. We need to understand the importance of ceremonial processes, uh, benefits afterwards. I think a lot of people get really fixated on what happens during the experience. 
I would argue that the jewels are in the path after the experience. You're prepared in ceremony to see things afterwards, and that's really where the fruits of your labor are. And I'm interested in the role of live music and not just recorded. I think we need new generations of ceremonialist people who can play music live to people in the psilocybin state, which because people are so tuned in, you have to be really careful, can't be too loud, you got to avoid certain instruments. It's going to be gentle uh, and insightful. Uh, but we do know mystical experiences kind of break down that, that normal uh, differentiation in consciousness where we've seen as separate. Uh, Walter Ponky was an original researcher. He did the, the, the Marsh, um, uh, what was it, the March Church Good Friday experiment. Are you familiar with this? One of the early experiments in psilocybin. He was a divinity student, and they took, I think, 26 divinity students who were there studying to be priests, and they gave half of them psilocybin, and the other half not psilocybin, and they all went to church. And the remarkable thing is the 13 people got psilocybin, like their lives were changed forever. And they continued to go on and talk about the most amazing experiences of their life. It was really clear then you can't uh, blind psilocybin studies. It was just pretty clear who in the church was on psilocybin <laughs> and who wasn't. Um, so anyways, he was the original guy at that, and he described some of the nine universal characteristics of mystical experience. He unfortunately passed away at a very young age. He went scuba diving and then never came back. Which is interesting, because scuba diving is often the... Um, the metaphor that uh, people use to talk about psychedelic experience. Like, how do you explain psychedelics to people who have never taken psychedelics? It's like explaining being underwater to people who have never seen water or explaining to people. Who you know, so I think it's an interesting comparison. Um, and it's just an odd irony. But you can see the sense of sacredness, a noetic quality, positive felt mood, there's a transience to these, and then persisting um, changes. I like Bill Richards' term, unity of consciousness. I think these states are really unity of consciousness. Um, this is Roland Fisher. This is 1971, and he was trying to make sense, much like I was, the, the experience of the yoga samadhi, which is this quieting of sensory perception, quieting of the mind, stillness, that emptying of the mind, and the way in which you know the same kind of states can be uh, achieved through more ecstatic means, which are more shamanistic, whether it's ritualized drumming, singing, dancing, whirling, dervishing, any of that. So this is quieting of sensation, this is heightening of sensation, but they both bring us to a common state, which is this either one side mystical rapture or yoga samadhi. But as you can see, he's kind of got, as much as they're different, they're kind of joined on the bottom there. And that led me to think about, I thought his kind of model was a little bit incomplete, so this is something I'm playing with a little bit, which is, I know it's a lot to look at, and you don't have to get it all, but if, this is his kind of model on the top. So you have the yoga samadhi on one side, mystical rapture on the other. And then I think that there's a whole other side. There's an underside. I think he's kind of missed part of it. So what I've added is just, you know, there's a difference between, this is ordinary awareness, that's the other side. That's, I think, where we go in these dimensions or realms. We experience something that is either the underpinning of what we normally experience or is an added level that we experience. But in many ways, in our daily lives, through outward rituals, we enhance our sense of purpose and presence and awareness. And by quieting and relaxing, we can kind of turn inward and have the insights. And if we travel to the other side, which is the world of spirit and of archetype, these mystical realms of the psychedelics, you can have a mystical rapture, and you can have yoga samadhi. So that was just kind of my attempt to kind of bring them two together. And if you're interested, I can share you uh, later. And you know what this is. I just have a few slides to close. A prize for the person who can guess what this is. Is that my seat? That is. I knew you get it. That is my ceiling. Networks, interconnectivity. So you know what this is. Neural close. I'm glad you guessed neural pathways. No, this is the internet. <laughs> Doesn't that look like neural pathways? A decentralized network. Can you imagine if the internet was centralized? The one hub goes down, everything goes down. It's decentralized. It's hubs. It's networks. It's interconnectivity. This is that, and this is probably the cybernetic intelligence that's coming through the internet. It's probably part of the reason that we're getting more interested in psychedelics. It's not ironic that coders really the ones who popularized. Um, microdosing. Uh, and Terence McKenna called it. He said years ago that this would lead to a, a heightened state of consciousness to do that. Uh, and again, now you got your neural pathways on the left, and this is an image, computer simulation of the universe. So you can kind of see the same na network pattern of interconnectivity, of rich branches, of nodes, of, of connections, is really the very basic fabric of life. And just to close, now if you're familiar with the notion of Indra's web, uh, so you can see here, and all these little dewdrops, there's a reflection of every other dewdrop. It's that fractal pattern where the whole is contained in every single drop. It's a reflection of the whole. So the notion of Indra's web is the basis of these networks. At every node, you can see into the whole. 
And that was, I think, come through in, in our exploration of the psychedelic experience. So I'm going to leave it there. I think hopefully there's some time for questions. Otherwise, we can have a long Okay, since there's no questions and answers, um, so yeah, I was wondering um, if you're familiar with James Kent's psychedelic information theory or yeah. something. You should definitely read this, and it's, it's along the same lines as this. I literally just finished it for the second time today before I came here. And what's the name? Um, James, Kent, James, uh, Kent. James Kent. James uh, Kent, psychedelic information theory. Okay. So it deals with everything that you're talking about. And it's uh, very pliable to yeah, like you know people who aren't um, you know involved in academic like academia to like look at how these things are affecting the brain. It's an amazing book. Um, and also, um, I know that you mentioned you're interested in music. Um, have the uh, sort of putting that out there to maybe look at uh, electronic music as well as how this is because I, I I work with a lot of people in the underground psychedelic scene yeah. with um, you know side trance and whatnot. Yeah, they create rituals and, and it's it's very amazing, right? So I didn't know. Yeah. You didn't mention that it's not live music, but it's it's so interesting. Yeah. It's been kind of what I delved in for the past years. That's so, amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hey, thanks for your talk. I saw you speak at Mountain of the Minds and uh, another um, very interesting uh, series of slides that you've uh, provided. I just want to ask a quick personal question before yeah. I think more clearly about some of the scientific, academic. Um, stuff. Did you say that you had microdose every day for eight months? I did a um, five on two day off schedule. That, okay, that's what it was. Because yeah. at first I, I thought but, you yeah. said just straight up eight yeah. months in a row. And I, I yeah. thought that was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, that was statements. I did the statements protocol. Five, five on two off? Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. There's a variety of different protocols. Yeah. yeah. Lion's mane and ice. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, thanks for uh, including yeah. that. That is also of interest. Yeah. Well, how did you uh, feel about that? It was really helpful. Uh, there came time to stop, but it, it was really, I learned a lot. Obviously, I'm interested in the yeah. spirit of the moment, so it helped me there, and it helped me strengthen my spiritual practice. Did you have anyone else that was like nearby? Um, I know you kind of like went to your, our friend of your, like, yeah. maybe, uh, was anyone else, could anyone else uh, provide like an insight as to like maybe your like energy, your like your ability, your like insight, <laughs> like, and so on and so forth, you know what I mean? Like, Sensitivity. High sensitivity to light sounds. Oh, really? Yeah. So, interesting. That's really interesting. I mean, our house tends to be more candles and dimmer stuff, but you were, kind of like, you were kind of like, whoa, yeah. this is, yeah. you're more sensitive to, to sounds. Yeah, makes sense. I'm also, okay. I'm also synesthetic. Okay. Um, even off psychedelics. So really? I think, that, I think that was a little more strong as well. Oh. Really, yeah. for uh, that um, uh, length of dosing, uh, yeah. you would consider yourself to yeah. 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 Okay, great, thanks. Maybe I'll figure something else with that scene and give it a go. Yeah. Um, due to all the limitations of the current therapeutic models, I was wondering what you think of uh, like modern religious practices that include psychedelics, like Santos Daimio and yeah. Kenya. This is very interesting you asked that, because the last talk I did, I was asked to speak to a group in Kingston, and for some reason I went on and on with ayahuasca churches as the answer. Um, so <laughs> my answer. I think ayahuasca churches are really important. So my question has always been, I remember, so Bruce Coben is the one who's leading Theracil, and he's in Toronto, and I drove up to meet him, and we're meeting in a coffee shop in Parkdale, we're talking about psilocybin and how to get it to the people, and all around us are uh, straight evolved people on crystal methamphetamine, clearly not doing well. And that's kind of my people that I worked with for 25 years. So I'm like, we got to do something for this group. And I think ayahuasca churches are the answer. If you really want to work with people who have a lot of challenges and a lot of trauma, um, and really that was the birth of ayahuasca churches. It took the medicine of the jungle and brought it into inner city Brazil. And it worked in communities of high unemployment and high alcoholism. And the reformation that's occurred now for 40, 50 years is unbelievable in terms of those communities. And we've been studying that. So I think there's a huge application. I'm not a huge church fan. I'm skeptical of the hierarchy in churches, but I've heard Jessica Rochester, who's the head of Santo Daime in Montreal, speak a number of times. She's a pretty impressive woman. Uh, and I think that church model, they have legal, there are now I think five legal ayahuasca churches in Canada, including a couple in Toronto, I believe, and in Montreal. So I, I do think there's a real case for an application, because it combines every two weeks that psychedelic experience, which they keep people busy, as you may know, with ayahuasca churches. You're singing, you're dancing, you're chanting, you're meditating. There's none of this lying back and moaning and puking. You're kind of keeping you busy because the, the, the idea is the medicine's cleaning you out and fixing you, and it's keeping you busy. Uh, and then I think people, you know, they cook together in Brazil or they spend time together. It's structured. People get peer community support, that belonging that comes to the church. So I'm super interested in, in where that'll go. I wish you could start an ayahuasca church that wasn't kind of so rules bound. 
Yes, at the back. Uh, quick sort of introductory question. <clears throat> when you have the uh, best practices, like yeah. the, could you, for somebody that doesn't have yeah. too much experience on these, sort of like no. the things to watch out or how to, if you're getting into this, um, what would be yeah. your, like, first five tips or so? You right. mentioned male, female. Yeah. Uh, I grab a yeah. Do you mean people using it recreationally? <coughs> yeah. Exploratory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, I think your state of mind going into it is really, really important. I'm a believer in the kind of preparatory kind of dieta. I think if people eat clean, fast the day of, I think that works. No alcohol for sure. You know, I was at a, a friend of mine has a brewery. I was in Ottawa at an event, and there was some guy up front who was really having trouble and he's sweating and he's panicking and I heard him talk to his friends, he'd done too many mushrooms. But he's doing mushrooms in this fluorescent light place with 400 people around <laughs> and driving music and like, that's just the wrong place to do mushrooms. So do it with your good friends, do it in nature, give yourself some time and space so you won't be interrupted, take care of yourself afterwards and then just make sure, I, I, I usually make mushroom tea, I think a tea does well with people. Uh, a lot of people don't like the taste of mushrooms. And I think if you add ginger and lemon, lemon, the acid potentiates the, the psilocybin a little bit. And then the ginger palliates people's nausea, so they're making it a tea. And just making it as ceremonial as possible. Can I, can I add something? Yeah. Also with the tea, don't boil it. Yeah. Um, if you bring it to a boil, it'll degrade the psilocybin. Yeah. And what the lemon's doing is actually creating an alkaline environment so that the psilocybin will break down the psilocin. Uh, so it's more active and it has less of a duration. Um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to be with everybody. And and what you said about Vieta though is <laughs> is like your diet is like as somebody who's had a lot of experience, it really does make a difference. So like no meat, uh, no milk products, at least three days prior, no sex, no sexual activity, um, none of that, and yeah, like keeping yourself in a good sleep pattern, it, it really makes a difference. It really does. Thank you. That's okay. excellent. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a sure. Yeah, that's a really good, they use, and it's interesting because a lot of these clinical trials use, um, some of them use dozens of uh, outcome measurement tools or assessment tools, and it gives you uh, the impression that, you know, in a clinical trial you're kind of fishing for evidence, but some of them they would use is they measure something called oceanic boundlessness or dread of eco-dissolution. So these are standardized tools to measure altered states of consciousness. There's also something called the altered states of consciousness questionnaire. So basically be people's responses, subjective measurement, scale responses on those tools that they would then use to gauge whether or not it was a mystical or transcendent experience. I think the trial with the least mystical experiences was that uh, in the addiction, uh, because we saw both alcohol and tobacco would uh, dampen a little bit of the psychedelic experience, but you have alcohol. Yeah. yeah, they were given these questionnaires, yeah. And my other question was, um, this is like probably a beginner question, um, but so I was wondering, you were mentioning like suggestibility on yeah. psychedelics, and like, um, I also like old Freud to have that fun, and like Freud in his early like, um, hypnosis experiments, he found suggestibility was a detriment to the therapy of process, because he might just say whatever, and the thought therapist wanted them. Yeah. How do you try to not make that problem in um, psychedelics? How do you not make it? Yeah, the suggestibility kind of scare what they therapy. Yeah. Think the therapist expects. It's a very, very good question. I don't know if I have an answer, but I think when you realize the hypersuggestibility that comes, it's it's a bit of a, uh, a note of caution for us uh, in terms of what are the messages that we're promoting, mm -hmm. and then what is the content of the preparation. So I think those preparation experiences, and we live in a culture in which people don't really know how to make sense of these kinds of experiences. So, and one of the other things, I remember the reason I started teaching more about ayahuasca, even in my course at Queens before I had really got interested or discovered plant medicines, was just looking from a drug studies perspective, ayahuasca was interesting because people in different places would have a similar experience or from different cultures would have a similar experience. So this is the whole question around, is it culturally determined what you see or is it implicit and there's something natural about it? So why do people who have no connection to the jungle see black panthers or jaguars or snakes when they use ayahuasca? So I, this is an indirect way of answering, and I had a friend of mine who was saying that he didn't see any of that imagery in ayahuasca ceremony, but I asked him if he felt that kind of 
pulsating, undulating sense of, in ayahuasca, you get that kind of movement through the room, which is, if you're from the Amazon, you would see that as a snake. Or sometimes that honesty you get in psychedelics, where you know it's, you're thinking something and it's like, God, no, well, get, out, get off of yourself. Like, and, and your delusion's kind of dropping, you're clear. A lot of people would see that in, in, in more land-based societies, that's the Black Panther, that kind of ferocity of it kind of in your face. So some of it is that suggestibility, I think, comes down to what kind of message are you going to prepare people and how are you helping to interpret after. So I don't have an answer other than I think we need to be careful. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just understand psychotherapy because I'm actually out of myself and into the myself. But yeah. I, I could be wrong, but my understanding of psychotherapy is like, at the end of the day, it is about atomized self. And we need, so yeah, these elements that problematize us yeah. can problematize the process yeah. of psychotherapy. Yeah. So in my understanding of psychotherapy, the, the two factors that uh, determine the, the, the outcomes of psychotherapy in terms of positive outcomes are trust in the therapist and then belief or coherence in the worldview of the therapy. So people do well in psychotherapy irregardless of the school of practice that the therapist practice under, so whether it's modality is, as long as the, the, the client believes in that worldview and what they're saying makes sense, is coherent, is meaningful to that person, and if they trust the person. So I think part of the thing on psychedelics is you can have enhanced feelings of trust, enhanced feeling of connectivity. But I think you're right to raise some of these issues. I don't know if I have an answer. But, but the, the, I also, though, can I say yeah, that, is um, in these therapy sessions, there really shouldn't be words exchanging. So it would be it would be songs like prayers or languages that maybe that person wouldn't hear. So it's, it is, I think. You're talking about the session? The yeah, the session sessions, yeah. itself. You're talking yeah. about it becoming problematic. Yeah. Well, MDMA yeah. therapy would be done MDMA and you're talking, but yeah. so seven, you're quiet. It's really just preparation. You're talking and then integration after. Yeah, I'm not sure if we're addressing what you. I think you're on to something interesting. But mm -hmm. Keep pursuing it. Yes. So my most of my uh, suicide and ayahuasca and all those experiences have been very much like a full-on entity communication. Yeah. So and, because of those, yeah. I have seen and experienced so many things, and I feel like the the setting that these churches provide is a pretty safe space. Yeah. So you don't get like negative thoughts. You don't get anxiety. Yes. Yeah. Because I feel like the, the entities, the trick, tricksters and gestures, they are kind of like influencing us. I was like totally like a atheist type, yeah. but then I was like, these are like so full blown, like right in my face, like I can't yeah. even deny it. Yeah. I go exactly. every night, I'm like, yeah. did I really talk? And then this thing starts coming at me, and I'm like, yeah. okay, this is real. Yeah. And then they teach you things, and you're like, yeah. wow, <laughs> I learned from you. And they're usually like in the yeah. nature, so like all of the, outside of the city, so you see like millions mm -hmm. of the stars above you. It's really like yeah. so hard. Yeah. It's awesome. Really a steady, steady. Yeah. There you go. One more. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I shouldn't be the last one because it's a very practical question. You mentioned in one of your slides that people that have a propensity to neurosis yeah. uh, could experience uh, a negative yeah. Uh, path. Yeah. And if somebody is in that situation, and they're already either in ayahuasca or mushrooms, is there something you would recommend to calm them down? Or is there a technique or <laughs> a food or something that are Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, there's different approaches to that. Uh, a lot of people um, will argue that what people need to go through, they need to go through. And so don't interfere unless the medicine do its work. I know in the clinical trials for people who would really be freaking out, they would have taken them out and medicated them, primarily with an anxiolytic like a Valium. Uh, I know some people who work with mushrooms who, if people are having difficulty, they'll use ghost pipe, which is also a kind of pseudo mushroom that is known to kind of bring you down. Um, mostly, though, it's people being taught to surrender, let go, endure that. If, and that's where I think that whole, I think Larry was onto something when he talked about the Bardo and the Book of the Dead. Because that really does, if you read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it's a mistranslation of the name. But it prepares you for those difficult experiences. And, and to, to kind of put it in a nutshell, is to see those fearsome entities as a projection of your own mind. And then they dissolve into you and you gain their power. I think that's generally the coaching that's getting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 As a short from the way to remember that, I watched America's Funniest Movies. <laughs> Any, anything else? Yeah, I would love to interview you on Rick's Funniest Videos. Yes. Um, I've experienced with uh, this thing called Rape. That yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And if it's, it's not accessible, uh, you can get um, 
N A D plus nicotine amine, adena, adenine dinucleotide plus yes. friends. So this, this is vitamin B3 yep. you inject it in your nose. Um, Interesting. And, uh, it kind of like yeah. takes you out of the high. Yeah. Yeah, Ape is an Amazonian snuff used usually pre-ceremony or, as you say, with people having difficulty in ayahuasca ceremonies as well. So and they use it a lot in yeah. Very beautiful. Yeah. You can actually get that at, um, yeah. uh, in Kensington Market. There's a shamanic yeah. store. It's, it's, based, yeah. Yeah. it's based on mapacho for people know it's really strong and jungle tobacco. Yeah, they use it with combo a lot. Yeah. In yeah. combo series. Like during a combo ceremony. Yeah. yeah. Thank I you think, very much uh, for having I you. think she had a question. One more question. Yeah. Right here. I just wanted to um, yeah. ask you if you could kind of differentiate between mushrooms and ayahuasca because I've done, like, I've had mushroom experiences before, yeah. and they were completely transformative. And I think I want to, you know, kind of go to Peru one day and go through the official ceremony. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could kind of touch on that. The similarities or differences between my, yeah, the mushroom state like, and ayahuasca. Exactly. Okay. And just how much more mystical it yeah. is and whatnot. So biochemically or pharmacokinetically, they'd be similar. 5-HT2A are agonists. Um, in terms of the impact neurologically, it's similar. I think the experience is a little different. I mean, from my own experience, I think mushrooms are very much heart medicine. They're a little more bodily, a little more downward you know, nature coming up, whereas for me, ayahuasca is like big crown. It's a little more the spirits and the entities. So I, I, I think psilocybin is a little more heart. And it's, I think the thing with ayahuasca is long as well. Psilocybin is a shorter experience, which so we've been used clinically. And I think that people can get into distress in both, but I think there's something about the brevity of the psilocybin experience that makes it more manageable. That's a quick answer, but it's a very good question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we all want to thank, I want to thank you, Ron, for uh, Great talk. It was really informative. It's going to be out, up on uh, our site in a few days, uh, up for eternity. So you educated the world. Yeah, really, you educated the world. I want to thank everyone for coming out. I myself, I'm a linguistic, uh, VP Finance, uh, along with. Uh, okay. the president of the I'm Harley, the administrative assistant. And I'm Abdullah, the director of events. Yes, so thank you all for coming. We're going to have a few more this year. We want to thank Ron. We have a gift for you here. Uh, thank you. A letter of appreciation. Uh, oh. Something to you recover much. your parking at least. Thank so, you. That's awesome. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. We thanks appreciate you. it. Thanks for having me. It's nice meeting you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, yeah. thanks guys for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.